Brilliant. Thank you, Juliet, for this introduction. And thank you, everybody, to be here uh, with us today. It's a really, yeah, really exciting uh, exchange. We've been, uh, um, yeah, we've been kind of cooking this for a while. So it's great to, to be able to to actually have this experience together and also to to have a set of uh, uh, also participants here uh, with us. So as uh, Juliette was saying today, uh, we are co-hosting the IID debate with uh, Architecture Sans Frontiers UK. And this is part of an ongoing collaboration with a network of organizations uh, striving to secure access to adequate housing in the inner city area of Johannesburg. Uh, and it's, here that, uh, it's great that we have here uh, with us, uh, uh, those organizations are presented, such as SETI and one to one agency of, of, of engagement. We're going to introduce some of the speakers uh, soon and we're going to hear from them and the work that they are doing there. But also, we are putting that in dialogue with uh, experiences and partners. Uh, uh, some of them we worked uh, quite closely with, uh, uh, such as the ones in, in Sao Paulo uh, and uh, some uh, new. new uh, conversations as also with the colleagues in uh, in London uh, are striving to, to a similar type of agenda. So this event is also part of a wider uh, agenda for IID focusing on, on housing justice. We have been uh, putting a set of, of projects, initiatives, learning exchanges, advocacy work around, around this topic. And for us, focusing on the retrofitting of informally occupied buildings is crucial to advance a more socially just uh, city, as well as uh, for us to make progress uh, towards a more environmentally sustainable urban development pathway. Making sure that retrofitting efforts secure space for affordable, as well as community-led housing, is key to secure the right to adequate housing, as well as to address social inequalities in cities. It can also enable socially just pathways to decarbonize uh, cities. And in a recent uh, report that uh, Build Change published, for example, improving existing buildings can save 60% embodied carbon compared to resilient new construction. So it makes sense environmentally and it makes sense socially. In a recent online publication that uh, my colleague Camila Cosinha and I uh, have written, we have uh, documented some of the experiences of housing social movements in Sao Paulo in relation to the decarbonization agenda. And we show that uh, there are very clear examples of, of how a socially just pathway of community-led housing can actually make a really substantive and important uh, progress towards the decarbonization uh, uh, agenda. So if this is so clear, the benefits of it in so many different ways, why is it so difficult to get people-centered and affordable experiences of retrofitting in inner city areas of the ground. Why we have so few examples of good practices in, in this field. So this is a, a key challenge and a key topic that we'd like to discuss with uh, our panelists. Today we discuss in more detail the policy and pra practice bottlenecks to this question. Uh, and we want to hear really concrete uh, and practical experiences that social, technical, and legal support organizations are facing when working with grassroots groups to try to, to, to get this off the ground, to really to implement initiatives of affordable, inclusive, and sustainable retrofitting of existing buildings for affordable housing. So who is in the room with us today uh, speaking? We have uh, uh, Lauren Royston, who is the director of the Research and Advocacy in Social Economic Rights Institute called SERI, based in Johannesburg, that has been doing lots of interesting legal uh, uh, work, especially to try to protect uh, uh, communities against evictions in, in Johannesburg. And also from Johann Johannesburg, we have uh, Sifisu Mitimunye, who is a project manager and a technical assistant for a very exciting organization that's called One to One Agency of Engagement in South Africa, uh, which is a group of uh, built environment professionals that have been working with communities in so in various different ways, from upgrading of informal settlements uh, uh, to the advancement of affordable housing in the city areas and using design methodologies to to do that. From uh, from London. We have uh, uh, Saskia O'Hara, who is a legal case worker and community legal organizer at Public Interest Law Center. And uh, she will be talking about her experience in working with communities and using legal systems to try to advance the, the right to adequate housing in London. 
And from uh, Brazil, we have Ricardo Moretti, who is a, a, a visiting professor at the Universidade de Brasília and a member of Labijuta, who is a, a, a research group called uh, uh, Territorial Justice Laboratory or, or Laboratório de Justiça Territorial in the Federal University of ABC. And uh, with Ricardo Moretti, we have a long history of collaboration uh, from IID, but also ASF, Beatriz de Cali has also done a series of works with, with him as well, and in conversation with South Africa as well. And finally, uh, Beatriz de Cali, who is a reader uh, in urbanism at the School of Art, Architecture and Design at London Metropolitan University, and also managing associate of ASF UK. And uh, Beatriz is gonna be talk, talking particularly to this collaboration and the history of what's going on uh, in, in relation to what ASF UK with the support of IID is doing with this network of organization in Johannesburg around this agenda. So we have a bit of a, a, packed, uh, a, a packed conversation. We're gonna divide the conversation into mostly three, three blocks. The first block is gonna be around some of the policy and practice bottlenecks to advance this agenda. And we're gonna hear from all the speakers. Uh, then the second block, we're going to be hearing from them on the, the experience of supporting and engaging with communities, uh, what, what role has that played, what has been the experience of communities and their support organizations in advancing that, what have been the main challenges, and also some of the wins that they've had uh, in, 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 this, uh, in this field. Then we're going to have some question and answers. Uh, time for you to, to also keep uh, throwing us your questions, uh, comments in the chat, please. And then uh, after that, we're going to ask each of the panelists to, to tell us what's, what's next for them, well, where, where, where is the, the, the crucial issues that they're focusing on right now in this moment, uh, and, and that, that, that's actually uh, you know, the, the main things that they've been working on in the more immediate times. Finally, we then have uh, Beatrice, who's going to tell us about the collaboration in Johannesburg and the next step on, on that collaboration. So let's start. And Lauren, I'm going to start with you, uh, bring you in. So tell us a little bit about uh, the, the policy and practice bottlenecks from your experience in uh, advancing this agenda in Johannesburg. Thanks, Alex, and hello to everyone who's on the call in the, in the meeting. I think that the, the key issue that I would like to raise is whether or not there's a place for the poor in Johannesburg's inner city. So there are a lot of occupiers in buildings in Johannesburg in the inner city um, precincts that have been abandoned by their owners and are derelict and have been over many years occupied by poor people. Um, so occupiers in South Africa have statutory protections and that's based on our history. So I'd like to address that firstly, um, uh, well, secondly, firstly, I'd just like to address this systemic problem that we're experiencing which is the lack of affordable and formal accommodation for poor people in the inner city, which is a good location. Um, it's not only about affordability, but it's also about availability. So we've done a series of snapshot surveys over a few years, which indicate that um, even the lowest priced uh, rental and social housing units are not affordable and they're very few available. The other important point about the system in operation is that we're really operating in a context where local government is in a severe crisis all over the country. Um, and then I must mention last year in August, on the 31st of August, there was a fire in an occupied building um, in Albert Street called the Usundiso building and over 70 lives were lost. So this question of occupied inner city buildings is really quite high on the agenda. Um, in terms of what's available, we've got a constitution which protects the right to housing. And in particular, in section 26, so it's section 26 where you would read the housing rights. Section 26.3 is that no one may be evicted from their home or have their home demolished without an order of court, made after considering all the relevant circumstances. No legislation may permit arbitrary evictions. Critical year is the leg legacy of apartheid. And uh, with that came forced removals and massive dispossession. So that's what the constitutional clause is trying to address. Then we have something called the Pi Act, which gave, which is the Prevention of Illegal Eviction and Unlawful Occupation of Land Act. 
which we refer to as the Power Act. It's an unwieldy um, act uh, in name. Um, and it, it's the law that gives effect to Section 26.3. So before making an order, an eviction order, um, a court must consider all the relevant circumstances and it must be just and equitable. So that's the historic, that, that's the current framework. Um, we've also got a policy framework, which is the Emergency Housing Program, a national framework which is meant to deal with uh, people in crisis, either evictions or natural disasters. And then we have in Johannesburg something called a TEA, which is a temporary emergency accommodation. So that's the framework. Um, one of the important issues which I'd like to raise now is how we have a practice of upgrading in informal settlements in South Africa. The application of that practice to inner city buildings does not yet exist. So we're really hoping to learn uh, from others on, on in this event. Um, there isn't a program of affordable public rental. There is on paper, but it hasn't been rolled out. Um, it's called Rooms for Rent, um, and it's contained in a fairly recent um, policy of the city of Johannesburg. Um, people living in the buildings, um, the issues around basic services, um, the issues around their social needs, they're invisible to official systems. Um, and one of our strategies, and I know FISO will deal more with this, is how to make these places livable. So whilst the framework puts in place options for relocation following a court order, uh, that's one of the key procedural requirements. Um, we're also interested in exploring how people may stay, and we could apply an upgrading logic to these buildings. So the key problems are urban management. There's very little urban management in the inner city of Johannesburg. There's even less building management, even in those buildings where, where people have been relocated by the city of Johannesburg. The building management is, is very weak and in some cases quite absent. Another key blockage, and Alex, I'm nearly done, um, is recalcitrance on the part of the city of Johannesburg, non-compliance with court orders, um, stigmatization and discrimination of people who are living in occupied buildings. Um, the stigmatization concerns uh, there's a social stigmatization and there's also a discrimination in attitude, not in law, around uh, migrants and foreign migrants. Um, and one of the key phrases currently being used in the media and by politicians is this notion of hijacking, building hijacking, which we don't use because we don't fully understand what it means. Um, but we can talk more to that um, perhaps in conversation. The, the important point that I want to end with is our Legal framework, constitutional framework exists. There are a series of legal principles that have been enacted uh, due to uh, rulings from the Constitutional Court and the Supreme Court with things like the procedures required, substance, substantive issues like temporary emergency alternative accommodation must be provided if people would become homeless, uh, which is often the case. That's why people are living there in the first place because they don't have a home and um, meaningful engagement, which means that people must be talked to, consulted with, which doesn't happen very often. And the final one, legal principle I'll mention, is about municipal joinder. So even if an occupation is in a in privately owned property, the municipality has to be joined uh, because it's a state obligation to um, protect residents against unlawful occupation and to provide alternative accommodation. Thanks, Alex. Great, Lauren. Thank, thanks for that. Extremely clear and really insightful. And I'm really glad how you also mentioned these challenges of uh, of uh, applying the lessons learned from an upgrading of informal settlement perspective into the maybe incremental improvements of uh, of, of buildings in inner city areas. Maybe it's if so you can come in here and tell us a bit more about some of the challenges in, in exactly in that operation uh, from a much more practical perspective, maybe from a physical perspective, a built environment perspective, what, what do you see uh, as some of the main bottlenecks in, in that respect? Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren, as well. Uh, hello, everyone. 
um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are in the world. Um, we focus a lot, as Alessa said, on the physical environment. And what we do in that space is we, we look at um, community engagement, and then we also look at um, the physical environment in terms of the technology as well. So what I would like to, to, to focus on, Alex, is actually, I think where some of the bottlenecks lie is actually in the policy formula, the policy environment and processes as well, not just the formulation. Uh, some of the policies are very good, but the way they have been applied doesn't really work in the city, right? And you can see this with, firstly, uh, the, the policy environment in that the difficulty for community members and stakeholders who try to enact change in the city in accessing policies. You find that a lot of these policies are behind a lot of red tape, they're behind a lot of um, bureaucracy and so on. So it's very difficult for um, uh, residents and people to access those policies. And secondly, we, we see that there's a lot of like, there's a lot of um, disruption in the political environment, which has an impact on the policy environment. So we have We've seen a couple of mayors come and go in Joburg. I think we've had like four different mayors in the last two years. So that's caused disruptions and um, has slowed down the policy environment and, and has made it difficult to implement that as well. Lastly, we also see uh, the lack of funding for improvement of buildings, the improvement of urban environments, the, uh, the, the, the helping of um, people who are doing the groundwork. And we see that in the form of like, where you have city improvement districts that do not, for example, bring in people who do not exist in the state apparatus who are trying to push this agenda for just housing in the city of Johannesburg. Now, this has impacts, this has effects on the physical environment of the city, right? So we see that this leads to um, housing shortages, a lot of overcrowding, uh, which in some instances, a lot of evictions and exclusions. We see that in Joburg specifically, you have uh, poor living conditions, which in some instances can lead to fatalities, right? As we've seen with the Joburg fires last year. And this is also causing a lot of um, disruption in the social fabric that leads to things like crime, you know, um, bad living conditions, health conditions, and you, and, and so on. Um, thank you, Alex, that's all for now. Thank you, Sophie, so that's uh, really, yeah, really clear again, and then, Highlight many many issues that I can already hear some uh, uh, parallels, Ricardo, with uh, with the Brazilian experience in some way. You no, know? uh, maybe could you could you draw some reflections from São Paulo when you're hearing the yeah. colleagues from Johannesburg? What what does it trigger you in terms of some of the policy and practice bottlenecks uh, in São Paulo? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alex, and everyone. Nice to be here. Well, uh, we've had a big fire in the building in. in in the city area of Sao Paulo uh, six years ago. And after that, uh, there was a, a big campaign trying to, to find where the risks are war. Yeah? And it was a, a big fight. But we are trying to show that instead of uh, going into these buildings, 51 buildings in, in the city area of Sao Paulo, to try to find where the risks were, it was more important to find what could be done to improve the security. It's like a, the opposite way to look at that. Uh, it, it was quite a, an interesting approach and they, they, they got to do it. And it was an important victory. We, we got a, an important victory also uh, to consolidate as a legal basis to put public money in private owned buildings. Uh, we use it as a reflection that if it's, if there are legal basis to put public money in informal settlements. Uh, so uh, there's no uh, impeditives, there's no problem to put public money in housing units, private housing units in high-rise buildings. So we got to put it in the three, Brazilian has three federal, uh, federal instances with autonomy. It's the federal government, the state government, and local government. So we could prove that there, there are 
basis to put money on that. And then uh, nowadays, uh, the census has just been, the, the, the data has just been uh, put on the media. So uh, nowadays, Sao Paulo, in each five uh, units in down in the inner city areas, one of them is empty or abandoned. So we have lots and lots of abandoned buildings in Sao Paulo. And there's a big fight in order to, to put these buildings uh, also to low-income people. Uh, the, the local government in Sao Paulo nowadays is a very, very conservative government. It's, I don't know how to say, Alex can help me. It's an ultra-right ultra, ultra right, uh, government like the ex-president. No? So uh, it's quite a problem. Nowadays, he, he announced big investments on buildings in the inner city area. Something like uh, just with uh, investments, like subsidies of about $200 million. But then what happens uh, for, for each kind of, of building? What, what kind of building? Well, they, they are putting this money for retrofit, like uh, you take everyone out of the building, and then you make um, you change the entire building, put it to the brand new standards of construction, and then you sell them to the brand new new reaches of the city. Like uh, is they are not going to low income groups, so. Uh, we, we think it's like a save who can pay. You know? Who can pay? It's a good solution for who can pay, but for low income, it's really a disaster. And so we are trying to, to show the big difference of this policy to one that could uh, put money to incremental improvements of buildings while people are living in it. Uh, so that, that is the moment we are dealing now, trying to show that the retrofit that is going on is not uh, enough, it's not good enough. We have to have uh, action, public actions in incremental improvements. Um, thank you, Alex. Good. Thanks, Ricardo. And uh, yeah, thanks Thanks for, for, for demonstrating also how the retrofitting agenda is extremely desirable for market-led forces that are reproducing inequalities rather than opening up opportunities for, for dealing with the city's inequalities. So let's go to, to Saskia. Saskia, how, how does all of this relate to London? Could you tell us a little bit uh, more from your experience? Uh, uh, how does this agenda uh, plays, the, plays, plays itself out in, in the London context? Yeah, thank, thank you so much for inviting me to speak at this uh, amazing meeting. I think I'm 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 sorry to hear that actually the experiences um, that have already been talked about today are translated to London as well, um, although there are slightly different aspects. Um, public housing and social housing in London generally relates to estates, so I'm going to talk about housing estates. Um, and in London, we have over a hundred housing estates that are at threat of demolition. At the same time, we have an acute housing crisis, which I won't talk about now, but rather just point out that there is one. Um, and we have communities like the communities I, I help who are fighting to stay in their homes and fighting to keep these um, estates standing, even though the estates are in quite bad states of disrepair. We've already heard about disrepair. Well, we, we call it managed decline. Uh, repairs not being done on these estates, and yet people are still fighting to keep them standing because they know if these uh, estates are demolished, that means displacement, and it means displacement of communities, not just from their area of London, but outside of London. And so people know that their options for having some sort of permanent homes in London uh, means keeping those homes um, on the estates. Um, with an acute housing crisis, why are over 100 housing estates um, threatened with demolition? It doesn't seem to make sense unless you start to talk about the value of land. And the value of land in London is very, very high. 
And um, what's also true in London and across our country is that many local councils are facing um, severe crisis in terms of their funding. Um, councils across our country are going bankrupt. And so what we've seen over a number of years is local authorities looking at their assets, their public assets, which includes council estates, these, these housing estates, um, and seeing how they can extract profit uh, and extract capital from this public asset, which is housing. Um, and how has that played out? Well, it's played out by local authorities either selling this is the estate, the public land off to private developers for very low prices, actually, in terms of the commercial landscape, or local councils playing property developer themselves. So either selling it or, or doing it themselves. Um, and the onus has, has majorly been on demolition. And we have to ask why. Well, well, we can discuss that today. One of one of the reasons that we are investigating is, for example, a VAT exemption, a tax exemption when buildings are fully demolished. It's cheaper. So there seems to be a financial incentive behind it. Additionally, you can um, obviously build higher, you can, you can, um, it's easier to build, build more private land on those estates. Um, I wanted to also touch on what happens um, to low income Londoners who live on estates or around estates when those estates are demolished. What, what policy is there to protect them? Well, we do have policy around affordable housing in this country and in London. Um, but the starting point is that the term affordable is quite um, ambiguous and there's a lot of battles around what is affordable housing and lots of categories and it's extremely uh, confusing. But essentially the policy that we do have that says that affordable housing should be reprovided on these estates, um, the type of housing products they're talking about are to address the housing crisis for middle income Londoners which is very key. So what we're seeing in London is um, uh, not a solution presented to low-income Londoners, but a solution presented to middle-income Londoners who are also being pushed out. That's how acute the housing crisis is. Um, I'm not going to go into too much more detail on that now, but I also, of course, wanted to touch on the issue and policies around retrofit and around retention in this country. Um, and and why the onus is on demolition? Well, we we actually had quite a an interesting I'll call it interesting. It's a it's not great, but we had an interesting case that came to the High Court recently in the last few few weeks, specifically looking at the policies that exist in our country, um, around uh, retention as opposed to demolition, um, uh, with the background being the environmental damage caused by demolition, and unfortunately, our High Court. Um, uh, confirmed that actually um, there's no um, actual policy that says we prefer uh, re uh, retention over demolition. And if I just pull it up now, let me get my wee notes. Uh, yeah, there's no strong presumption in favour of repurposing and reusing buildings. Um, and, uh, and that actually it's just preferred, but in a very light way. So we have no clear policy that, that favors that whatsoever. And so actually that high court challenge was really damaging <laughs> in terms of that fight and that battle. I will just finish, and I'm, ha I'm happy to keep speaking on any of these points, but I'll just finish on um, any other type of housing for low income Londoners. And again, this is, is, is uh, really relatable to what's already been talked about. Uh, for Londoners who rent privately, there are no protections in terms of rent control. Um, there are no protections currently in terms of no-fault evictions. There is talk of some legislation. It is not here yet. Um, and there is a horrific um, uh, emergency in terms of temporary accommodation. And again, I've already heard, or heard this word in the meeting, but so many people across London, so many children, so many families are living in precarious, overcrowded, unsafe, temporary accommodation. And in fact, as housing campaigners, um, we call that the new social housing, is this temporary accommodation. And I'll leave it there. Saskia, yeah, thanks for this in input and also highlighting how the housing crisis is a global, is a global crisis uh, happening in, in so many 
different places across the world. And uh, and I think also the the question around incentives that you bring up uh, is we, you know it's not only about policy and policy frameworks, but if the incentives are not there, if they're contradictory to the actual policy frameworks uh, that might be there, then uh, we have a problem uh, that actually the practice of it uh, won't be. Uh, in line with with some of the policy interests. So so yeah, thanks thanks for bringing incentives into the question. Now let's go into actions uh, and let's go back to uh, to South Africa and to Johannesburg and Lauren. Uh, tell us about the actions that residents, community organizations, support NGOs uh, that they are taking. You know to 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 challenge uh, the, this issue and trying to to make progress around this agenda. Thanks, Alex, and hello again. Um, I would like to talk briefly about the relationships between three organizations in the inner city. Siri is one of them. And then the Inner City Federation is a group, um, is a federation of building committees in occupied buildings and rental accommodation, um, which I can talk a little bit more about if you'd like, um, and then one-to-one. -one. So firstly, the way that Siri works is we have three um, methods or tools at our disposal, litigation, research, and advocacy. So when it comes to litigation, um, our litigation has, there's been a great deal in the city of Johannesburg that has provided um, important case law precedent um, around what needs to happen with evictions. So there's, there's a sense that you can't evict anyone, but you can. You have to follow a lawful procedure though. So the evictions have um, been a key aspect of the litigation work that we do, so have disconnections. So the context in Johannesburg is that there are a range of different typologies, if you like, of these buildings that have been abandoned or have become derelict. Some of them are owned by the municipality and are meant to be managed by the Johannesburg uh, Property Company. Some of them are owned by social housing institutions, and some of them are privately owned. Uh, so there's variety there. Um, and what happens is that there are frequent disconnections of services. So many buildings, and I believe Svisa will talk more about this, many buildings are very precarious in terms of safety and health and access to basic services. When it comes to research, we've worked very closely with the Inner City Federation, for example, in developing um, what we call a community practice note, which is a publication which charts the history of the Inner City Federation since its establishment um, and outlines the strategies and tactics that it employs. And our re a research product like this is meant a to um, uh, boost the, the 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 inner city federation in its own eyes as well as um, providing examples to other social movements and community based organisations about what can be done and then advocacy critically um, in this context is um, there's three aspects the one is media advocacy uh, which is trying to shift uh, a narrative in the media, which um, is really uh, about how these buildings need to be either demolished or emptied of who lives in them because they are the homes of, of criminals, um, drug trade, uh, syndicates, and um, have been taken over essentially. So it's a complex narrative. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about what those different interests are in discussion. The other aspect of our advocacy work is community related advocacy, which is where we employ methods of popular education to raise rights awareness amongst the people that we work with. When it comes to policy advocacy, advocacy this is really difficult. I mentioned that we do have um, a, a very good and internationally um, recognized constitutional and legal framework, but there is, um, at a municipal level, there are some problems um, with the policies and particularly with their implementation. How do you go about uh, trying to shift policies and trying to move towards implementation of existing policies? That's one of our key questions. And the sand is shifting for us. 
There used to be an op many opportunities to engage the state at a local level and at a national level on the kinds of policy changes and implementation challenges that need to be addressed. With the fire in Albert Street last year, there has been a real shrinkage in the, in the space that is available to undertake mm -hmm. policy advocacy. We also are in an elections year, national elections in South Africa are taking place in May. Mm -hmm. And as a result, there's a lot of political uh, discourse around the inner city, some of which is very, is deeply problematic. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the Inner City Federation, the Inner City Federation does its own work independently of Siri. So for example, if there's a disconnection in a building, the Inner City Federation um, is able um, to represent people, uh, take some cases to court, um, and calls on Siri in cases where uh, professional uh, litigation and legal services are required. Mm -hmm. um, that litigation, litigation is demand-led, so we respond to requests from the Inner City Federation, and we are not the only um, legal services provider whom the Inner City Federation refers cases to. Um, with one-to-one, -one, uh, Siri can bring research, um, advocacy, and litigation expertise. The ICF brings mobilization, organization, awareness raising expertise. Um, we, with one-to-one, -one, we've got an exciting partnership underway, the three organizations uh, on data, which FISA I know will talk about. Um, the importance of the partnership with one-to-one -one is the technical expertise that they are able to bring, because yeah. um, we can't do that. So, Alex, I think I should stop there. <laughs> Sorry, Lauren, to, <laughs> I'm trying to interrupt you. But Sifiso, I think uh, Laura made a, a, a great uh, introduction. Could, could you pick it up from there? Thank you again, Alex. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, yes, as Lauren has said, we focus a lot on supporting. So we work together, as Lauren has said, with ICS, ICF and um, SERI. And we support, we bring in that technical support, uh, specifically in this specific project with uh, data, right? So what, what we have done is we've worked with um, ICF who have um, mobilized the community members and the leaders of those buildings to go into those buildings and um, capture data for us to help us understand what is going on in those uh, abandoned buildings and what are the challenges being faced in those abandoned buildings. And um, Alex, can I please show my screen? I would like to just show some of the work. Yes, go ahead. I think you can share a screen, no? All right, thank you. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. So ICF, um, they have building, building leaders who go into the city and they go and use the technology that we've built, which is a mobile survey that they load onto their phone. They go into the city and they collect and analyze and audit the, the buildings to see what the issues are in those buildings. So these range from the physical aspects of um, the challenges and um, risks. So for example, if you can see here on the images, you can see that there's things like flooding, the electric, electric wires hanging above uh, the water, which can be hazardous. There's uh, environmental issues like um, the lack of refuse removal services, you know, and then there's also structural issue, issues like building staircases and so on. So what we do then is we take this data that comes from the field and then we, we, we build, we've built a dashboard that then represents the data in a spatial format that our members, that our, that our team members in ICF and Siri can then access and view this data as it comes in from the field. And then they'll have an understanding of the people living in the building. So in the top right, in the top here, you can see some of the key statistics of the people we've, we've actually um, answer, asked questions to. And then you can also see some of the um, audits of the buildings, like the services and the and the um, infrastructure, in what condition it's in. Thank you. I will stop sharing. 
Thank you, Alex. All right, great, Sefiso. Thanks, thanks for for showing that. And, and, uh, and yeah, it's incredible also, uh, how the power of data and information and how that can feed into the the protection and the advancement of of housing justice in inner city. So thanks for for bringing that up, uh, Ricardo. How how is that uh, compared to the kind of actions and responses by community social movements, the support networks uh, in São Paulo? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, well, there's a very strong housing movements towards uh, central areas in in São Paulo. Uh, it's not the same in Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro now, uh, in, in just a little few years, has grown very, very much the uh, building occupation. There's, there's something like 40,000 people living in in central buildings, né? the occup the occupying, occupied buildings in Rio de Janeiro, but they are not so uh, well organized as, as they are in Sao Paulo, the social movements. Well, uh, the social movement got an important uh, conquest that was uh, the, what I should say, uh, zero eviction during COVID time. So during some years, it was no conviction uh, eviction, no eviction was allowed, so was quite an important. Uh, also, in the law questions, uh, there was uh, there's a there are some very progressive judges, but they are few. But some of them asked them, I uh, asked us to to develop a handbook uh, to about technical inspections in occupied buildings. This handbook uh, brings that notion that instead of trying to find where the risk is, is trying to find what we can do to improve the quality. And it was quite important because his handbook was uh, was sent to all the judges. So this idea of looking to the building and trying to get the security improvement was quite an important step. Well, uh, the... The community groups uh, now uh, develop this incremental improvements in a very, very nice way. Many, many groups now have uh, with very small amount of money are getting some important improvements of security. There, there's one case I just love that was one very high building with many, many people, like something like 4,000 people were living there, uh, had a fire. And in this building, as there was a formation of fire brigades, and during that action of uh, looking what possibilities to to improve security, and this brigade was was very well prepared uh, in a volunteer work of uh, uh, how do you say bombero Alex fire firemen civil like firefighters fire, yeah. firefighters. Yeah. Fire firefighters. So a firefighter, a civil firefighter, uh, has voluntarily uh, formed a brigade in the building, and the fire happened, but no one got hurt, and it was quite a victory that showed that this kind of of small improvements, many times with not so much amount of money, can be quite important. Well, but. No, <laughs> So many victories. It's a it's a big fight every day, and and the movements are all the time are trying to be uh, criminalized, and the stigma, the stigmatization, as Laureen has just said, is the same. So all the time trying to to show that they they the drug and prob and all the time just looking at the problems, not the solutions. Uh, but one important thing that is happening now is that uh, the, the social movements in the occupied buildings are nowadays, they have a group in the city council uh, that uh, discussing the public services, how to make the public service to become legal. Uh, this is happening in Sao Paulo, and I think it's quite an important uh, experience. But it's like that. Some conquests, but many, many, many problems and all the time trying to to breathe thank you thank you Ricardo thank you.
I think the, the in our conversations before, the way that you're talking about uh, uh, building codes in an incremental way, and I know you have done some work also comparing Sao Paulo and Porto around how, how can you frame building codes, not as a standard that is unachievable, but actually the, how you can engage with incremental practices uh, that uh, building codes can recognize that and support and, uh, and build a pathway for this incrementality rather than creating a standard that uh, that communities would never you know, totally unachievable and, and taking away totally the agency in, in that process so so really interesting precedents there that I think we we should really shed light and look more into detail uh, and this combination between uh, civil engineers and uh, legal uh, work is can be so powerful Saskia how is that related to London conversations and the actions uh, that communities uh, movements uh, support organizations are doing Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to answer that question, but, but I'm going to share a nice photo for you all to look at while I answer the question, um, which is a, a, a photo from um, outside the Royal Courts of Justice in London last year. Um, can you see that? Uh, with a community who were bringing litigation to the High Court and we were successful. Hurrah. Oh, great. Um, but but actually, what I wanted to pick up on, which is um, some words you just used, um, talking about the agency and not taking agency away from campaigners. And at the, the, the practice that I'm in, the law centre that I work for, that is top of our agenda is not taking agency away. And, and we do that by effectively trying to be movement lawyers. Um, and what do we mean by that? We mean that our, our prerogative is to support the aims of the campaign and crucially not to um, uh, put the, the, the law on a pedestal and move it above any other tools of campaigning. Um, we don't think the answer will come through the courts. We think the answer will come through residents and campaigners. Um, and so essentially what we're doing as lawyers is, is trying to handle a deeply conservative legal system and, and push it and fight with it to, to achieve campaigners' aims. So we've done that um, and we continue to do that in London and also in other parts of England. Um, the photo that you're looking at is related to a massive estate in South London. It's called the Aylesbury Estate. Um, that estate has been threatened with demolition and some sort of redevelopment since the late 90s, since I was about nine years old. <laughs> so it's a very long running struggle. Um, but some of the people that you can see in that photograph and primarily the woman in the middle of that photograph, who's an incredible warrior woman called Ison Dennis, um, she has campaigned for all those years on her estate to make sure that she could stay in her home and the building stayed, uh, stayed standing. And that has encompassed all sorts through the years. It's encompassed um, occupations um, of the estate. So lots of protests, um, the arts, documentaries, theatre productions, um, and also the law now. And we successfully litigated um, to halt um, demolition. I won't go into the details, they're highly technical. Um, but, but essentially to say it's a merge of all sorts that's happening, um, that's pushing uh, a housing movement um, forward. I, I'm going to echo again what, what Ricardo just said about, you know, essentially it's one step forward and sometimes two steps back. And also looking at the chat, I think somebody from Glasgow, fellow Glaswegian, Eva, wrote in the chat that, uh, you know, it's a shame there isn't harder, stronger policy in relation to, um, to the environment and retention. Um, no, there isn't right now, but we can fight and push for it. So do not be kind of uh, alarmed or upset. This is exactly what we're trying to do. And you can always push things forward. Um, but yeah, the question of agency for lawyers is, is a very important one. Never to take agency away from campaigners, never to platform the law above other methods of, of fighting and campaigning. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia. And um, let me bring some questions uh, from... Uh, from the participants here, those that have joined us in, in the Zoom. Uh, one question from Desmond is, what do you think are the forces behind effective implementation? What can be done to navigate around lack of implementation of the laws and policies? Uh, that's one. Why do you think about that, about the, the, the forces behind effective implementation? Uh, 
There's another one that more um, focused, uh, it's directed to Lauren Sifisu by Marcel. Uh, you speak about local versus foreign dynamics in Johannesburg and comment how this impacts local government to assist in the delivery or reluctance of uh, housing in the inner city of Johannesburg. Uh, and just on the side, uh, maybe if Sifisu can write uh, in the chat, uh, there is a question around the software that you use for the uh, spatial landscape. Maybe you can you can share that. But yeah, those key two very interesting questions. Maybe we start with the Desmond uh, question uh, and why maybe Lauren and Sifisu uh, think about it. Maybe I can bring uh, uh, Ricardo. Do you want to 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 tackle that first question around what do you think are the forces <laughs> behind effective implementation? <laughs> well, it's very easy. Real estate, no more. It's just one word. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, they have very strong interest in that. And look, uh, uh, they, they are the retrofit in the inner city of Sao Paulo is very profitable. And about demolishing uh, buildings, uh, I have some pictures I, I will send you, Alex, uh, because uh, we have buildings like uh, 45 meters high being demolished to build other ones with 100 or 120 meters as they are more profitable. So it's unbelievable what is happening. It's money, money, money. Uh, they, and, and, and racism, say they, they don't want to, to have uh, low-income people around, so it's a big fight. <laughs> There's many, many forces against implementation. What a shame! Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, there is micro flats, not nine, how how many square meters they are building? Yeah, there is more one, but the, 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 the how how much you pay for the rental is quite high. Mm -hmm. So, nineteen square it. meters. And Saskia, what do you think are some of these challenges of implementation in the in the London context? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, one of the things that that comes to mind is um, the revolving door between developers and and people that work for the local authorities, which has been documented in London. Um, which means that when, for example, big plans to to de um, demolish uh, housing comes to the planning committee where they can make the decision. Uh, they just wave them through, and we see a couple of years down the line that those same people might then. Uh, um, have positions in these large uh, development firms. Um, I'll post something in the chat about that. I mean, the other thing that's worth saying from a legal perspective is it is very, very hard for communities to access legal representation. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to get public funding in London for legal representation. Um, so yeah, hopefully we're we're helping to, to address that, but we're very small. Thank you, Saskia. Yeah. Uh... Maybe we go to Lauren and uh, Sifisu. Uh, Sifisu, do you want to ta start tackling some of those questions and maybe picking up on this discussion between local and foreign dynamics in Johannesburg and um, yeah, how this uh, it impacts local government's ability to assist in the delivery of housing or reluctance? Well, that's a very good question, Alex. And you know, I'd like to preface this by saying um, South Africa has a, a, a history of um, some, I don't know how to put it, so I'll put it straight, some really bad uh, xenophobia, xenophobia, and we've had some xenophobic attacks in the past. So I think we should handle this question with care and um, just nuance as well, you know. Um, I think first thing to notice is that the Constitution of South Africa does say that, you know, um, everyone's rights who reside in South Africa should be protected regardless of their legal status so we should start there right and then secondly i'd like to say that um you know when we went into the field and we collected data and we're asking questions to the residents of these uh hijack well of these um so not hijack but rather um occupied buildings is that we found that it's actually a very small minority of illegal foreigners occupying these buildings it's mostly south africans so there is that rhetoric that is not really supported by what we see in the data by fact so we have to be careful in that sense and then i think it, i mean we the, there is we need to have some empathy as well in terms of um foreigners are illegal foreigners are people regardless of their status and they too i think it's it's 
we should we should extend some grace in also um, providing services for them. So the city, I think the city must handle this with some nuance and empathy. Thank you, Sifisu. Lauren, do you want to have a take on one of or the other question? I would love to. Thank you. <laughs> so um, in terms of the lack of implementation, I'll just list a few things, and I think they probably repeat um, across these three different uh, cities. Um, not wanting poor people around, not knowing who they actually are. Um, you've got to follow the money to understand. <laughs> so there's a whole lot to say about that. It's both um, um, developer and development investment, but it's also um, um, alleged corruption. Um, people, the, the next point is people must wait patiently. That means in South Africa, there's a housing subsidy program and the delivery figures have plummeted over the last few years. And still, the state says, wait, for, wait patiently in a queue. So people who occupy are seen as queue jumpers. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fallacy. It's a discourse that has very little grounding in reality, because there really isn't a functional waiting list. Um, and if where it does exist, there is maladministration and corrupt allocation. We know this from project examples. Um, the other factor I'd say is what it costs. So the model of um, social housing is not affordable for most of the people in occupation. The model is not incremental. It's as others have spoken about, you move people out, you upgrade the building, they can never come back because it's not affordable. Um, there's a lack of com political commitment um, which is linked to the um, wait patiently. And then there's xenophobia, which makes the inner city an undesirable um, area to invest. And as Fiso said, it's also not based in fact. Um, while there are migrants from the region living in occupation in inner city buildings and in informal settlements in projects we work on, it is by no means a majority. So sometimes the facts are just wrong. Um, so the xenophobia, Marcel, it's had a massive impact, massive impact on, on people and lawyers in my organization, personally, um, on Siri and on our safety. Um, so that's uh, um, on, on our partner organizations who are not xenophobic, um, informal traders, and the Inner City Federation. Um, and it's led to uh, a dumbing down and a lack of nuance around what the issues at stake are. Because you can write off the whole project because it's foreigners and they are illegal. You can write off the whole project um, because people living in these buildings are all criminals. Um, and it's simply not the case. So we're calling for much closer attention to the people who live in occupation um, and to the actual conditions in buildings, to not painting them all with the same brush. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. Um, yeah, and, and lots of solidarity here from many other groups also working on the ground and, and experiencing some of those challenges. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, Part of this uh, uh, dialogue is also about that, right? So sh sharing the, the experiences and being able to be in solidarity with each other. And we have many very interesting people with a lot of experience here in the room with us. Uh, and I wanted to bring a couple of them in. Uh, Catherine, I think uh, you you asked a question. You, you based on the University of Cape Town. You have worked with uh, uh, organizations like uh, Violence Prevention through Urban Upgrading in Cape Town, uh, have been part of many of those dialogues uh, uh, around uh, the the issues in Johannesburg and Cape Town. Would you like to maybe make a comment uh, or ask a question? Uh, and I think, Ju Juliet, you're going to help to to maybe bring uh, Catherine in. Hi. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. We can. Can you speak? Uh, raise my volume a bit. Hi. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can. Quite low, but we can. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much. This is a fascin fascinating conversation. Um, it's really interesting to kind of hear the different perspectives from, from a global perspective um, and almost how similar some things are, but nuanced to their contextual conditions. Um, I, I mean, I'm speaking from an experience of very much in the informal settlement sector, which uh, in Cape Town, um, you know, about 10 years ago, where we started looking at various different alternatives. Um, and I really enjoyed that idea of the incremental improvements. And I was wondering if there's anything being kind of done in terms of uh, sort of the more shared spaces or the common spaces um, that can start working around um, sort of the ideas of safety and activated spaces. So we did a similar project um, where we looked at, you know, kind of the more public spaces. But so it was more the delivery of soft services that gave agency to community um, that started opening up different opportunities for recognition and tenure options. Um, so I was kind of, my, my, my head sort of going around and how do, you, how do we actually um, do this in inner city Johannesburg where, where there may be similar conditions to crime and safety that I've dealt with in places like Gugeleto and Nyanga. Um, but these are also spaces with amazing entrepreneurs um, and people involved in micro businesses and there, there is, you know, different voices in there. So I suppose those conversations are all uh, opening up. How do we actually move forward? How do we create pathways uh, for change in this very complex world? Great. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Ricardo, do you want to come in? Because I know you wanted to make a point about uh, a common good. Uh, and maybe there is something there around uh, uh, around incremental improvements uh, around the commons that you might might want to bring in. Yeah, uh, today is Water Day. I, I think it's International Day, isn't it? It's Water Day also every place. I think it's an international event, isn't it? Well, uh, I, I'm from Ondas, the national uh, movement towards the right to water and sanitation. And we are we are fighting in order to 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 affirm the right to water in informal settlements and occupied buildings. Uh, and what when the strategy we are using is making uh, trying to figure out what would happen if a person uh, from an informal settlement that has an informal job that has an informal car that is drunk and hits his car against uh, a wall and goes to a, to a hospital. And then you are the doctor there. Uh, the question is, should you treat him or let him die? Look, uh, he, he lives in a formal settlement, uh, a formal job, a formal car. It's a drunk. And do you treat him or not? So if if you are in the group that thinks that the doctor there in the hospital must treat him and avoid him to die, so I ask you, uh, why do you think uh, the public service of water uh, could not be provided to an informal settlement? Uh, one is the right to, la to, to life, uh, the other... And water is the right to life. So we've got some advances uh, in the sentences about uh, to state that uh, the water has to be provided, water and sanitation, uh, even in informal settlements. We are trying to, to share this vision because I, I, I think this vision is is powerful, help to... to I would say to, to fight for the narrative. Okay, thanks, thanks, Marec. I think that is uh, also yeah, like the question around commons experiences. Uh, um, I I leave it there. I think there is a uh, Ivan Turok also uh, prov makes a provocation here around uh, the role of the private sector. Is there a way of of engaging and uh, understanding that the private sector is very diverse, right? So we have a uh, very different types of private sector: small scale, large scale. So I'm sure uh, lots of possibilities there. 
But uh, let's go for a final round of uh, just inputs from all the panelists uh, in, in terms of what is uh, ahead. What is for you the next stop? What is that uh, it's keeping you awake at night now uh, in terms of the, the things you're doing and that uh, you, you, you're trying to get uh, uh, different alliances and initiatives. So please, yeah, let's go for that. And then if any of those questions uh, uh, instigate you to, to, to address them. Uh, and let's start with, uh, with Saskia. Saskia, uh, what is in your mind right now? So much. No, no probably not enough. Um, I mean, look, in, in our country, we, we're going to have a general election uh, probably in October. And uh, in the general election, we're expecting massive changes in planning. So that directly affects these housing estates and, and um, homes for low income uh, people and Londoners. And, and what we're expecting is a further deregulation of planning and mass house building, but again, aimed at, at creating homes for low, um, middle income Londoners. Um, so we don't particularly see that as a positive thing because it's, again, the question of narrative that I just heard. And, and uh, what, what is in my head and, uh, and what's kind of pushing me ahead is to reclaim the narrative that actually there are enough homes to house people. We do not have a problem that means we need to build homes. There are enough homes. As I've said already, there are over 100 housing estates that are threat of demolition. And so that's a very, very, very powerful message. And um, the other thing that I wanted to point out um, is that there is fantastic work going on from communities that are built, um, putting together alternative plans with amazing architects. Uh, there's a bit of trouble in terms of uh, making those financially viable, but people are pushing forward all the time and it's going to produce results. Um, also, I think one of the main things uh, for me in terms of hopefully uh, us achieving results as we go forward is bringing in to the conversation at all times those families, uh, those adults and children in temporary accommodation who aren't necessarily on the estates but they traditionally would have been housed on those estates. And it's about bringing everyone into the battle and everyone into uh, the realm of fighting to keep those homes standing and to refurbish them. Great. Thank you, Saskia. You made me think of uh, a sentence that was quite powerful politically in the Brazilian context uh, that, uh, that says that there are more homes uh, without people than people without homes. Uh, and yeah, lots of uh, interesting campaigns uh, putting stickers here. There could be a family living uh, with the images of the family. I know that uh, Housing Rebellion was doing something similar in, in Brazil. There was many campaigns around that. So a really important uh, narrative there. Uh, let's go to, to South Africa. Lauren, uh, what's in your mind then? What's keeping you awake right now? And what's the next uh, for you? Right. Thank you, Alex. So uh, I want to say that, um, in firstly, let me start with what's on my mind. This has been an incredibly useful exchange for us. So regarding the production of affordable public and social rental and private rental, Ivan, I don't know if Ivan's still on the call, um, I wanted to say to that point that I think, Ivan, we have to segment the market. Um, and be realistic about where the private sector can provide and where it can't. So that was a side point. The London experience is really interesting for us in this respect. And then we've been saying for a while that something else is needed, something different. We've named it an incremental approach. This is in conversations with one-to-one, -one, for example, um, and with um, um, Architects Without Borders. Um, and the Sao Paulo experience here is really important. And what one-to-one -one does and what supports that is already happening on the ground. Um, I think that what I would also say is that it's really important that we look at what strategies and tactics are currently being employed by people who live in occupation. Um, we would call those local management practices. Unfortunately, the hijacking narrative paints all occupations with the same brush. So you can't really discuss local management in the current climate, but that's where agency exists. Um, and unfortunately, if relocation happens, then these local management systems are destroyed. Um, I've seen it at close range in one building in particular um, over 15 years. So 
In terms of the next steps, number one, emergency basic services to all occupied buildings. Number two, categorization, planning. Categorize the buildings. We do this in the informal settlement program. Relocation now, because people can't stay, although they have been living there for a very long time. Um, relocation in due course, because there's not a long-term future, but there's not an imminent danger. And then incremental upgrade where people can stay. Uh, and the incremental approach is something that I think we, we, we can learn from based on what people are currently doing, but where they need support from the state or the private sector, um, essentially to make places more livable over an incremental period of time. The other element of this would be doing an audit of, of vacant buildings in the inner city of Johannesburg, of which there are many, and then the, the permanent affordable accommodation supply, the temporary relocation um, supply, that can then start to come together. Um, it's, a, it's a distant dream, but an important dream nevertheless, that we would not have to talk about temporary um, alternative accommodation if people become homeless as a result of eviction. But we aren't there yet, so we have to have a long-term vision. Final point, we have a very important process underway in Johannesburg at the moment called the Kampepe Commission of Inquiry into the Fire. The commission is looking um, into the specifics of that single fire in August last year, but its remit in Part B includes a more general look at what's going on in the inner city. Um, and we can do nothing but be hopeful that something will come out of this and um, that is for the good. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Sifiso, what's what's next for you in one to one? Thank you, Alex. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this has been very great experience. It's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting to to hear the parallels between um, what's happening in Brazil and South Africa. Um, there are there's a lot in common, and uh, also importantly, it was interesting to hear. Uh, what is happening uh, with the challenges in London, right? You would assume that the provision of social housing is sometimes used as a silver bullet that if it's there, then the problem solved. But as, as Sashka has, said, as has shown us today that there are still issues even when there is supply, right? And then from us, I think uh, from our side, what we will continue doing and looking forward is we, we, we want to continue with our uh, knowledge production in terms of data collection and monitoring. We want to expand our, the scope of the, the buildings we've been auditing, so to audit more buildings than we act currently are at the moment. We want to explore more technical innovation in this space to try and bring in more software technology to support not just ourselves, but our partners, the residents, and everyone is involved in this sector. And then we want to use that knowledge generated to continue to incrementally improve the buildings, right? And also just keep on shining the spotlight on the fact that um, these, uh, to these tall buildings, these structures, as Lauren has said, should also be given the same level of attention and um, urgency that is given to what we traditionally consider informal settlements on the outskirts, right? Because that's where you have legal um you have legal um tools and policies and so on that support that and have a strategy for that but there isn't really anything to support those tall buildings in the inner city that should also i think in my personal opinion be considered in formal settlements as well thank you Great. thank you sifiso um morachi ricardo from uh, sao paulo what's what's next uh, uh from from your experience from your work for la bijuta for the work that uh, you are doing uh, there with uh, with social housing movements? Well, uh, I do agree with Steve. There is a big challenge that uh, to have public policies and money towards occupied buildings, just as we have now for informal settlements. In so it, it's a it's a challenge too. I I do agree with with you, Steve. Well, we have some fights that are quite clear eh? against the eviction, against demolition demolition, uh, against criminalization of, of housing movements, and a, a big fight for to ask to seek to 
for public service in the occupied buildings. So this, this is a very, very big effort. But then uh, there are some technical things. I think uh, we need to go through the technical and law standards, law uh, uh, for incremental uh, improvement. Uh, here in Brazil, this is it's very, very weak, very, very weak nowadays. And uh, then uh, we think uh, here in Brazil, we need to think how to take money uh, to be managed directly by housing movements in occupied buildings. Uh, it's quite easier for the federal government to put uh, 200 millions in a project than to put a million in a, in a building. Uh, there, there are many difficulties. So how, how to, uh, there's intention to put money in these buildings, but uh, it's not, the path is not easy. So we are trying to find ways, uh, legal ways to put money directly into the movements. And also uh, we need money to technical assistance to incremental improvement. Uh, nowadays, th there are some technical support but then the money comes from architectural associations and things like that, and it's very little uh, amount of money. So we should put it in a, really as a public policy. So this is a challenge that we are trying to reach. I think is that. Thank you. And also, I would like to have everyone could be happy. Is that is that enough? <laughs> everyone, <laughs> happiness to everyone. Wonderful, Ricardo. Thank you so much. And um, connecting a bit what uh, Lauren was saying about local management systems, and I know also ongoing conversations from a more local government perspective. I know that we have colleagues here from United Cities and local governments in the call. Uh, how public services is a, is a is a very interesting entry point uh, here, possibility for for coalitions. And there has been so many efforts, I think, to build a more popular approach to public. Uh, and civil society partnerships, uh, commons oriented. So how those type of partnerships can emerge between local governments and communities, uh, civil society, support uh, organizations in ways that they can be uh, supported and operating services uh, with communities on the ground. I think it's, there could be a lot of possibilities there for, for a, a more clear agenda of collaboration and conversation, particularly with local governments uh, to try to, to make a way in, in that that front. Now, we are now coming to an end of our seminar, but before we go, we would like to bring in uh, Beatrice De Cali, who is gonna explain to us uh, what is this journey that uh, we are having together uh, and how this network is collaborating with, uh, with I mean, IID, ASF UK, with SETI, one-to-one, how, how this collaboration has been evolving and what's going to happen next. Uh, Beatrice, do you want to, to share with us your thoughts? I know you have some slides as well. Uh, yes, thank you. Just a moment. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. And thank you everyone really for the excellent discussion uh, of uh, always learn a lot from, from these conversations. And just to put ourselves in context a bit as Architecture Sans Frontier, um, ESF UK is a nonprofit organization. We are based uh, in the UK. And we our specialism is around community-led design and planning. So we use uh, design and planning tools as a, as a means to contribute to creating fair cities and uh, more just environments for people to live in. And our work has several distinct areas, but amongst this, the, uh, what has been bringing together so to these conversations and some of these partners is our Change by Design program. And Change by Design has been is one of our longest standing lines of work. And it has been using community-led design and planning as a way to advance questions of justice, but really most of all to, to deepen public, public participation and deepen conversations around uh, questions of uh, urban decision-making, urban management and planning. So we, we are really, through this program, we use design as a way of uh, yeah, thickening and deepening some of the conversations 
uh, around how we can create cities that are more equitable. So as part of Change by Design, since 2022, we have been uh, actively engaged in a series of uh, collaborative action and research projects in Johannesburg. And the focus of this has been very much around the topics that we were discussing today and on, on thinking about, uh, together with a quite broad range of partners, how we can promote housing justice in inner city areas with a very strong focus on, on thinking about um, residents of informally occupied buildings. So through this line of work, we have been working with One to One, who's been our partner, like with whom we've worked for about 10 years on a, a range of different projects. And we've been working closely with, uh, with Seri more recently and other partners to promote their innovation of inner city buildings uh, as a means of providing secure and affordable housing. IID has been a key research and policy partner in this work. And as discussed today, together we've been seeing this approach as a means to decrease urban inequalities by improving access to areas that are, are well serviced for low income communities. So what this has been translating into in, in practice is that we've been running a series of action learning workshops that have been using our change by design methodology to produce planning and design options and, and possibilities for uh, retrofitting informally occupied or, or vacant buildings. And we have been running these workshops uh, by working alongside uh, grassroots organizers, some of the organizations that have been mentioned today, the Inner City Forum, Inner City Resource Center. And in this process, we've been creating also a range of accessible learning materials because we, we find that this focus on learning is really crucial to support both professional and grassroots engagement in collaborative planning processes. So and there is an example of this is this multilingual guide to the right to adequate housing, which we have published just a couple of weeks ago, that is now available in English and Suthu and the, the Zulu version will become available next week. And through this series of engagement, then we are we are landing on a, a final one, well, not final, but on the next workshop uh, in, uh, in April. And the next step for this work would be a, this co-design and uh, workshop in Johannesburg, where we are uh, aiming really to help envision and imagine uh, a number of approaches and tools for it of fitting and maintaining inner city buildings. And, and for doing so in a way that ensures the right to adequate housing for low-income residents. So this is, uh, this is work that Youth IID have been supporting and where is FUK, one-to-one, SERI, and the Inner City Federation and Inner City Research Center will be carrying out towards the end of the month. So the event today was for us a, a really important grounding of this conversation within a, a broader debate. So thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Bea, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for those inputs and also to, to share the, the, road, the road ahead uh, and the next steps. Uh, we yeah we we really looking forward to the engagement uh, now in Johannesburg and the, and further collaborations. Um, I know that the, in the chat uh, the chat is is full of uh, exchanges, which is great. Uh, and uh, Lorena Zarache, a colleague from uh, the Global Platform for the Right to the City, is mentioned here. For example, if there are experiences of inner city building improvement programs, uh, and I think there is a. Uh, yeah, I, I think room room there for a collection of cases of trying to, I know that the Brazilian government just launched a, a, a program around re rehabilitating buildings in inner city areas uh, for housing of social interest. So lots of uh, lot interesting, I think, possibilities there to to also share uh, maybe innovations or good practices in, in this field. So um yeah i think that's that's the end of our call uh and uh, of a fantastic uh, conversation for today but uh, definitely not the end of these uh, conversations around housing justice uh, uh, we will continue to be promoting this type of work for my id in collaboration with all, all of you here those that are attending we hope to be doing more noise around this together and so watch out please join uh, activities and let's also build the joint uh, agendas, uh, advocacy, learning, and research uh, initiatives around this topic. We're really looking forward to working more with all of you on this. And I hope you all have a good weekend. 
and uh, yeah, um, good luck. See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you, Alex. Thank bye. You. Hey, bye. thank you, Alex, and everyone. Good weekend. Thanks, everyone. All the best.